Uh, good evening and welcome to History in Your Doorstep here on Bro Radio, the channel that loves the veil. And this is the programme that revisits the history that made the veil what it is today. In these programmes, we visit places and people that have formed the history that we are meant to be taught at schools, but not necessarily are. Uh, well, today's guest is Gavin Douglas. Hello, Gavin. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so, Gavin... Uh, I would I would describe as an as an enthusiast. Do you think that's a fair a fair description? Yes, I, I wouldn't like to be called an anorak. <laughs> <laughs> so, so shall I keep quiet about the model railway we were looking at? Yeah, in, well, no, let's uh, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it might crop up. Um, well, in the program, we're going to be looking at the earliest days of the railways in the Vale. What brought them here? Who brought them here? What they were doing? Uh, where they went? Uh, then we're going to explore in a bit more depth a couple of landmarks that might be familiar to people. Uh, first of all, uh, the famous viaducts uh, that we have in particular Port Kerry, which is probably the most iconic, the one you certainly see the most on Instagram. Uh, and when also something that might be familiar to people who uh, knew Barry in the 60s and 70s, uh, the old locomotive graveyard. Um, so we'd be talking about that. But let's kick off by going right back to the beginning. So. As with most things in the development of uh, Wales's more recent history, uh, at the forefront of it was industry, was iron and steel and coal. And the, the railways were no different. Our earliest railways uh, were there specifically to, to get those products to market. So in terms of the, of the, the, the earliest railway lines and, tr and locomotives that we had here in the Vale, what, what, where did it all begin for us? I think we go right back to the beginning, to the, the Merthyr Ironworks, Crawshaw's Ironworks, yeah. and we have um, the Cornishman, Richard Trufizic, uh, a steam engineer who, who built a locomotive. Um, he built a lot of pumping and winding engines, but this is a locomotive um, called Penny Darren, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a bet to see whether or not it could pull um, I think it was 50 tonnes of coal or iron down to uh, Aberkinnon on what was called a plate wear, a flange way. These were not quite rails, but flat plates with an edge that wagons could run around. And um, the locomotive was successful. Yeah. Uh, but there really wasn't another successful steam locomotive in these parts for another 20 years. So a lot of the early colliery tram roads, as they were called, were used horses for haulage. Oh, and of nice. course, there was also a canal network, um, you know, going all the way up there as well. There was, I do know a wonderful anecdote, actually, about uh, tr the, tr how true this is, I don't know. But as you know, I've done quite a lot of research into, into history that is, that is uh, around pubs. Uh, <laughs> and there's quite, there's quite a famous story that after they had managed to demonstrate the, the capabilities of the, the new locomotive that they'd pretty much just invented, uh, they all decided to go out and celebrate, um, but didn't really take the precautions you're meant to take when you finished using a locomotive, which resulted, which resulted in it exploding <laughs> while they were celebrating its launch down the pub. Uh, so, yeah, maybe not quite what they were after, but uh, no wonder it took them 20 years to, to, to get back on that page. It probably took them that long to repair it. It did. Ha it did have a problem on that competition because the the pump apparently wasn't working, and they managed to get all the way there on one boiler fill, but they couldn't fill it up. So if they hadn't dropped the fire, the same result would have been the the, the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so not not as great a resounding success as you might have hoped for, but anyway, they well they won. So what can you do? Um, so th that's what started the locomotives coming down to us. But where, do, where did they first come into the Vale? Where was the point of entry as such? Uh, the first Vale line really was the, the Great Western Broad Gauge that was laid from Trepstow to, to Swansea, mm -hmm. uh, which came through in 1850. But it was a fairly northerly route uh, yeah. past just to the south of Clantricent. I think the station there is two miles from the town. Right. And it really missed out areas like, um, well, our Vale towns and, and the coast. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and what was that predominantly just carrying? Uh, was it carrying passengers at that time? Or was it predominantly just uh, freight? It, it, was, it was both. But of course, there was a, a huge outlet already for South Wales coal, uh, right. uh, particularly around the Bridgend uh, area. And uh, that was needed in England for 
for industry and for locomotives. So there would have been a lot of coal trains uh, right. going all the way through in those days. So, so what what changed that then? What was the catalyst that 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 saw uh, further lines through other parts of the Vale? Well, the thing that really uh, developed was was coal uh, and industry uh, and ironworks. Um, we also had the valley lines beginning. So you had the Taff Vale Railway, which had its heart around Pontypreeth, mm -hmm. and uh, further east, the Rumney Railway, uh, which th ran through Estrad Menach, Gafili, Bargoid, uh, to Cardiff Docks. So both these lines ran down to the Butte Docks in, in Cardiff, where previously there had also been uh, a canal. Mm -hmm. And there's another railway to the north of that, the Brecon and Merthyr, which um, Nowadays, we've got the preserved narrow gauge um, Brecon Mountain Railway there, but from Tall Pantai to Taliban to Nusk, yeah. this railway had a fearsome gradient of 1 in 38. I mean, it, wow. it's the absolute limit of, of steam traction. So it was always challenging to run that one. Yeah. Uh, and gradually they found out, and more and more collieries appeared, especially um, around the Bridgend area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot, uh, particularly in the a sort of uh, 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 the Garu Valley, the Llinvi Valley, uh, and also around Amber Kenfig and Kenfig Hill and all That's those it. sort of places around there. So some people look to connect these mines to the sea. So there was a thing called the, the Ogmore Dock and Valley Railway, which oh, right. got a, an act of parliament in 1883, and it hung on for a number of years. Um, a major problem, as we discussed earlier on, uh, was Tusker Rock, which was right. a, a major threat to navigation. So just, uh, just to clarify, this wasn't just a railway line. This was a whole harbour being planned for the, the yeah. estuary of the, uh, the, the Ogmore River. It was a dock, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and a railway line to connect with the collieries uh, up the valleys. Yeah. Uh, and as always, the Great Western Railway um, had an influence, and uh, I think because they weren't keen to support it, it it uh, it eventually got killed off. Well, what really killed it off, Graham, was the the Tusker Rock. Yes, just made a, a dock there uh, yeah. impractical. Well, it is a ridiculous place to put a dock. I mean, the, the, <laughs> if you ever see the surface of Tusker Rock, it is it's 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 like an elephant's graveyard. It's just yeah. full of bits of boat sticking out. Yeah, um, from across the centuries. <clears throat> Um, then there was another proposal uh, way back in 1872 for a, a bridge end and Barry railway proposal. Mm -hmm. um, but that depended on there being a railway between Cardiff and Barry in the first place. And, and that didn't happen. In fact, that happened incrementally uh, by joining up with a couple of short lines that came up from Cardiff to places like Penarth and Coggan Pill. Mm -hmm. uh, so at that stage, that line didn't exist. So the Bridgend and Barry Railway proposal um, stayed on paper, really, uh, and never got an act of parliament at that stage. Right. Uh, meanwhile, the Taff Vale Railway, which I, I told you had centred around um, Pontypreeth, yeah. they, they put out a branch to Cowbridge mm -hmm. because that was to tap into the sort of agricultural riches of the Vale. And of course, um, from Carbridge, you could get right into the heart uh, of the valley systems at Pontypreeth. And it got an act of parliament in July uh, 1862 and opened in 1865. And there was always an underlying agenda to extend that line to Aberthaw, mm -hmm. where there was a lime works. And as we know, an old port where I believe John Wesley came across from uh, Cornwall on one occasion. Well, so he came across a lot. He was very, uh, just tapping into our previous guest, Sir Brooke Boothby, uh, at Funmun Castle. He mm. was a regular guest at Funmun Castle. He was very, he was very close to the, to the Joneses who lived there. Um, so yes, uh, and prior to that, the port at Aberthaw was the main port for this part of Wales. It's far, far bigger than anything in, in Barry or Cardiff. It was yes. The, certainly in the in the sort of Tudor period it was it was tremendously busy so yeah so were there plans to to, to uh, reinvigorate that old port and get it back into action well I think that was that was the idea I haven't seen anything 
specific on these plans, but the, the plan would have been to um, maybe increase the size of the lime works, right? Because of course that limestone, uh, as here in Rus and at, now at Aberthaw with the, the major lime works, produces very very good quality Portland uh, cement. Yes. Um, but for a lime works, you need coal going in because right. you have to burn burn the limestone. So that would have been a traffic both ways. And I think you've also got this agenda, um, at least in people's minds, to extend the line from Aberthaw to Barry. Right. So that would have been a direct threat from the Taff Valley Railway uh, to any schemes that were originating from the Barry end. Right. And I think that remained a threat for a long time. Yeah. And Barry, of course, uh, became... Uh from virtually nothing became a, a significant industrial hub um, with the birth of the docks and of course that yeah. that would have been fueled by the uh, by the rise of the railways did that first that... come about and and what part did the railways play in that uh, it's always big money so we have a consortium of big coal mine proprietors uh john corey very famous yeah uh, a guy called archibald hood um, and the landowner lord windsor uh, they got together because they were unsatisfied, dissatisfied with the Taff uh, Valley Railway's rates uh, and the accommodation, uh, the sidings, etc., in Cardiff and the dock charges. Right. Um, so they wanted basically a cheaper outlook for, for, for export and for transport. Mm -hmm. uh, so they put in a, a bill uh, which got Royal Assent in 1884, and mm -hmm. the first section of the railway between Cogan and Barry Dock uh, opened to passengers in December 1888, and the dock right. itself opened in July 1889. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, uh, the, the Barry docks became the biggest of all the coal exporters from South Wales. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what did that, what was the effect of that on our railways? Well, the Barry, the Barry Railway Company really started from scratch. Uh, right. they, they also wanted to tap into some of the coal traffic from the bridge end down. So they, they had a branch line that went from Caduxton, sort of northwest uh, to the Great Western Main Line at Peterton Surili. Um, that, that disappeared with the beaching cuts, uh, but there's still the remnants of a station at Gwenvo. Um, but of course, because some of that coal traffic went over Great Western Rails, it wasn't entirely revenue purely for the Barry Dock and Railway Company. So they always had an aspiration to extend further west and get into that coal field directly. Right. OK. Um, and in terms of the, the volume that that created, I'd imagine... We're, we're talking about thousands of tons being transport, transported by rail at that, at that stage. We're talking millions of tons. I'm looking millions at a table tons. here. Uh, yeah. I'm looking for 1914 Vale of Glamorgan Railway, um, Coity Junction at the top end, yeah. uh, over a million tons, Cowbridge Road Junction, 69,000 tons, total tonnage that year, 1 million 150,353 tons. Wow. So you're looking at lots and lots of trains of about 40 wagons a, a time. From a standing start, that is quite astounding in such a short, short space of time. Yeah. Absolutely. And so from an engineering point of view, I mean, it must have presented uh, obstacles to, 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 to get, get, you know, a, a railway line capable of transporting those sort of levels a, a across what was largely a, a very rural area. Yeah, I mean, the country is fairly easy, but as you know, the, the lias, limestone underneath is very hard. So mm -hmm. what the railway surveyors do is they take the easiest routes with the, the, the shallowest gradients and they try and avoid sharp curves because that requires more effort to, to pull. Um, and what they try and do is if you have to make a cutting through a hill somewhere, uh, you want to balance that with an embankment to, to use the spoil. Mm -hmm. And what they could also do was to, uh, when they did quarry through um, some of these rock cuttings, that stone that they quarried could be used for building bridges and other works like platforms and things like that. And indeed, viaducts. Yeah, sure. 
which brings us neatly on to um, certainly our most famous viaduct, um, which, as I gather, we're very lucky to have. Wasn't it absolutely beset with disasters from the beginning? Yeah, I've just been reading before we came on the uh, the Board of Trade Inspectors from the Railway Inspectorate's um, initial report about it, and he, he said there were a number of shortcomings with the design. Uh, and most of these have got to do with uh, the depth of the piers, and mm -hmm. when you build something like this, you actually have to do sandings, you have to drill down and find out where the bedrock is. Yeah. Um, it also had big approach embankments either side, which didn't have um, what they call stone abutments to stop them moving forward. Right. Um, and it's got something like, uh, well, it's got 15 arches. Right. Yes. So, um, so it's a huge, a huge structure. Absolutely. From rail level, I think the tallest is 110 feet. Wow. To the valley floor. So there's an awful lot of stone, and with that weight, you've got an awful lot of pressure on these piers. So I think in, it was 1896, when the thing was nearly complete, we have um, three of these piers failing, uh, oh, right. piers 10, 11, and 12, which is towards the, uh, the barry end. Mm -hmm. uh, and they started to sink by four feet. Uh, and one of them had to be taken down completely and uh, rebuilt, and the other two had to be underpinned in two ways. They had to go vertically down something like 18 feet to find the actual proper hard rock. It's like the story of the house that was built on sand. Yeah, gosh. <laughs> so they built on a, a shallow um, layer of rock which had uh, clay underneath, and the weight, the sheer weight of the bridge um, went through that. So you underpin it and you make the foundations wider to reduce the overall pressure. Mm -hmm. So that had to be done. And did, was it done successfully? It was done successfully and uh, the thing opened and it got, it was approved also for passenger transport. Uh, but the Board of Trade Inspectors had some misgivings about the, the embankments and um, there was to be a speed limit on the bridge. Uh, mm -hmm. The embankments had to be checked daily. And they also had the, the extraordinary uh, precaution of having a watchman uh, right. on duty on the viaduct itself. Wasn't and this indeed, all wasn't this all at the recommendations of, of a former uh, military engineer? Yeah, it's a guy called Lieutenant Colonel York, uh, Royal Engineers, and yeah. in those days, uh, and until recently, the, the Board of Trade Railway Inspectorate, who uh, passed new railways for approval for, for opening, mm -hmm. they were all military engineers, because the Royal Engineers uh, used to operate railways for the army before, um, right. before other organisations took that on. And these guys... Um, were, were trained civil engineers. So they understood everything about bridges, embankments, earthworks, all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, do we suspect that he wasn't altogether happy with uh, the design of the one at Port Kerry? I, I think he wasn't altogether um, happy with it. And uh, when a further disaster occurred, it was a, a sort of, well, I, I told you so. I, I knew I wasn't very happy with, with this. Um, <laughs> It says, for example, he said, the viaduct is, is a handsome work, but its design presents several features which are open to criticism. Um, the arches are very light. So basically, when you build an arch, uh, you do it over uh, wooden formwork mm -hmm. and you make layers of brick to form the arch. And I think this bridge had six layers of brick, uh, but there should have been either seven or nine. And oh, furthermore, right. Uh, they use lime mortar, um, and you know from your experience of uh, lime washing Porth Kerry Church. <laughs> we'll come back to that. <laughs> you can come back to that. Um, but concrete, uh, concrete cement should have been used. Right. And he said the actual ground force on the base of the piers at seven tons per square foot was excessive, which implies that there was a risk of sinking. Which, in fact, did happen, Graham. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> so he knew what he was talking about. Didn't the embankments collapse as well? Didn't I, I, it was yes, there was, there was a problem with the embankment, uh, I think, at the other end of the bridge, because they are very tall. And yes. uh, basically, it started spreading at the base. 
And to check that, because there was no wall, no abutment holding it back, they put in some very large rocks around the base, mm -hmm. and that seemed to check it. Um, so that was a, a fix that, that worked. So how did they get around all of these problems? What did they have to do? Well, eventually, on the 10th of January, 1898, at uh, just after the 7 a.m. morning passenger train had gone over, the watchman, now whether he'd been there before the train passed or not, we don't know, but uh, observed uh, number 13 pier, which is two from the end, at the Barry end, sinking. Uh, and the, the viaduct walls uh, bowing outwards. Was this so, while the train was going across? No, the train had just gone over. Right. But it, it could have been a, a sort of, uh, you know, another Tay Bridge disaster with a passenger yeah. train going over the edge. Oh, dear. So they had to close the bridge, Graham. What's wow? So how, is there? But there's no alternative. Surely, if the bridge is closed, that's it. The line. Yeah, they, the, the directors had an, an emergency me meeting, and and they brought in other engineers. Uh, they weren't very happy with the original contractor who'd done the work. They brought in a guy called Strain, uh, who looked at it and uh, came up with alternate designs. They had about three options. They could um, rebuild the bridge. Yeah. Uh, they could build a temporary wooden structure, which they, they did debate, uh, and they could uh, do a bypass, which in fact is what they did. Uh, quite a long one of, I think, two miles, 44 chains, which ran basically from Porthcarry around the head of the valley where the, the road and the, the airport is now, mm -hmm. uh, coming in towards the roof end, and it was controlled by a signal box at each end. You can still see traces of that now, I believe. Is that right? I think you can. I think you can, because it, it must have been fairly substantial. And, and I think there were one or two bridges as well involved, over bridges. Right. So you can still, yeah, you can trace that route. Oh. Some of it, I think, has been covered by the airfield. Yeah, definitely part of it is underneath, because they had to build that land up quite high to make sure that the end of the... Of the yeah, the runway, runway. extension. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that yeah. Is, I think it's under that, quite a lot of it, so... So they did an extensive rebuild uh, of the viaduct, um, as you know York would have would have intended. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's the the rebuilt viaduct is is a very stout structure, and oh, here absolutely. we are today. And I took a beautiful picture of it just the other day that had lots of likes, and I think that's that's what really counts. Yeah, it's a wonderful piece of engineering. It is. It's fantastic, and it's uh, it's it's reminiscent of uh, one of the one of the the, the prevailing sites of of the um, of the Vale of Glamorgan, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, we're now uh, going to talk about something which uh, put Barry on the map for an awful lot of people. But I remember the very. I'm not. I must confess, I'm not from Barry. But the very first time I ever came to Barry, I think I was a wide-eyed ten-year-old boy, and um, as the car I was in came over the the peak of the hill and, and you could look down uh, down towards the sea. For the first time, I saw um, what people from the town will identify, identify with as the uh, the locomotive graveyard, a never ending line of locomotives. Now, I'd never seen a locomotive in my life at this point. They were they were not uh, certainly being used uh, every day on the, on the railway lines. Um, but weirdly, if I was ever asked to draw a train, I would have drawn a locomotive. And I can't really put my finger on why that was. But there was this amazing place. Now, what do you know about this place, Gavin? Well, you've got one thing right, Graham, which is to call an engine a locomotive. Because oh. one thing I, that really annoys me is people describing engines or locomotives as trains. I could so that, easily have strayed into that territory. That, <laughs> that is what luck. the locomotive pulls. Yeah, there's a guy, very famous man called Di Woodham, who had this scrapyard and a contract to, to break up um, rolling stock from British Railways, which was going through this ambitious modernization plan to scrap steam altogether. It happened in the last steam train was a special, the 15 guinea special mm -hmm. that ran, I think, from Liverpool uh, in August 1968. So up to then and after then, there were huge numbers, thousands of steam locomotives uh, being scrapped. Uh, and I would have had a contract for that. But before he started breaking up or cutting up the, the locomotives, he, he was also 
breaking up a lot of wagons as well. So for a, a long number of years, you had these locomotives lying derelict, sometimes being uh, bits being taken off them by enthusiasts like nameplates and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually the preservation movement cottoned onto this. And by this stage, you've got a number of preservation railways uh, which are trying to preserve steam engines. And some of these locomotives are being used either for spare parts or salvaged completely and rebuilt over a period of years. And many of these are still running now with mainline boiler certifi certificates to run on uh, network rail. Mm -hmm. So uh, Di Woodham is regarded, you know, he's a saint as far as uh, railway preservationists are concerned. So why were they why were they being condemned in the first place? What 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 was the big problem with them? The big problem is uh, one of image: dirty, smoky, dirty trains. Um, mm -hmm. The railways were very run down after the Second World War. There'd been a lack of investment. Um, part of the earlier modif modernization program was to design new steam locomotives, yeah. uh, and they did this during the nineteen fifties. Locomotives like the Britannia. That mm -hmm. was uh, exhibited at the uh, the Great Exhibition after the war, uh, the Empire Exhibition, or the Commonwealth Exhibition, uh, and some of these were only a few years old, you know, ten years old by the time they were scrapped. And I think the last lo steam locomotive built was one called Evening Star in Swindon, which was uh, a big freight engine that actually did spend some time in the Welsh Valleys. The right. problem is, Graham, these locomotives, steam locomotives, require an awful lot of work. Uh, they're dirty. Um, they take a long time to fire up, maybe 12 hours or so. Uh, you require a fireman and a driver. Uh, you require a lot of other people to feed and water the locomotive. It has to be oiled up. Its tubes have to be pulled through. The fire has to be dropped. The grate has to be cleaned. Uh, all these things take a great deal of time. And in the 1960s, uh, a lot of young lads didn't really want to get into that dirty line of business. And diesel locomotives, by contrast, you just press a button, it comes into life, and uh, when you don't want to use it, you switch it off. Mm -hmm. Whereas a steam locomotive, you have to put it to bed, it takes hours and hours to cool down before anybody can crawl inside it to clean out its innards, and so on and so forth. But steam engine men, they had to start their working lives as cleaners, cleaning the wheels and the motion and all, all these parts of the locomotive. They learned how the locomotive worked doing that. And then mm -hmm. they got a job as a fireman or a firelighter. And they progressed the way up uh, the rungs until they became an engine driver. And then in due course, maybe by the time they were in the late 50s, a top link express driver, maybe take your train from Swansea to London Paddington. Right. But a hard life. Yeah, it sounds it. And of course, the diesel, for all the lack of romance, um, is, is infinitely more practical, I suppose, in terms of being able to start it up and switch it off and not have half the amount of work put into it. Well, what they used to say is that when a steam engine went wrong, you'd know instantly what the matter was, but it'd take a week to repair it because it was big and heavy and clunky. Mm -hmm. With a diesel locomotive, you wouldn't have a clue what had gone wrong with it. It could be the electrics, it could be the motor, it could be a switch. Take seven days to find the fault and five minutes to repair it. Right, yeah. So he didn't He didn't follow the instructions to destroy them all. He, he took his time and did the rolling stock first and kept lots of locomotives dotted around. How, how long was he there for, do you know? I, I'm not quite sure when it lasted. I mean, it, it went on to the 1970s. But right. They were there to the 1970s, and there were locomotives still being salvaged in the, the 1970s. I mean, perhaps we need to do another program on Di Woodham Scrapyard. And I would, I would, I would highly recommend that. Suggestion. Find some examples of these locomotives still running today. I'd like to thank Gavin Douglas very much for joining me this evening uh, and talking about the history of the railway lines, the viaducts of the Vale of Glamorgan. Um, before we disappear. I've just got one little anecdote I think I'll share with you, Gavin, which uh, is courtesy again of our, our guest from our previous show, Sir Brooke Boothby, who was talking about, this is the very early days of the, uh, of, of the viaduct of Porth Kerry. One of his ancestors and a group of, uh, of, of men were taking part in a, in a pheasant shoot. 
uh, in what is now Porthkerry Park, but at the time was part of the Romley estate. Um, and a pheasant shot out and was, was quickly dispatched. But just as it did so, a train passed over the top of the viaduct and the pheasants yeah. dropped straight into uh, where the driver was, who held it aloft like, <laughs> like, like a glorious trophy before disappearing out of sight. <laughs> so, so there we go. There's there's crossover with all of the aspects of the veil that we talked about on this show. But look, until the next time we meet, thank you all very much and I'll speak to you soon.